delight to do your will, my God. Let us sing the song. I say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I will agree, and my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. everyone. Welcome to Grace Fellowship Baptist Church. We are so happy to see all of your smiling faces. And I just want to remind you to remember to wish our pastor a happy birthday. His birthday was yesterday. And uh, Zara's birthday is today. We had a lot of May birthdays and we celebrated Ruth's 96th birthday yesterday. So Man, we've uh, we've just ha- we're very blessed Amen. to have some amazing people here. Oh, uh, yes, and Annie, we can't forget her. Her birthday was towards the beginning of the month, and Frank too. Frank, I think, hit the middle of the month. So we've got the whole month covered. I just want to make a little housekeeping announcement and say, uh, if you haven't put your cell phones on silent. If you wouldn't mind putting your cell phones on silent so that way uh, we can focus on the music and the service. Bill gets so easily confused and we don't want to make it any harder for him. (laughs) So we got to make sure those phones are off. (laughs) Also, Frank has uh, reestablished services at the Estates Healthcare and Rehabilitation uh, Center. They're doing morning worship services for the residents there. If you are interested, he would love to talk to you. He would love some uh, assistance and some help in that ministry. Also, another ministry that's coming up, VBS. If you'll notice, we just have a few slots open in the uh, sign-up. So if you're interested in helping, we do still need some assistance in registration. We We could still use some sanitization assistance and we also could use some assistance with music and Christy is awesome so you guys should be fighting to be working with Christy so just a few areas left we'll be glad to have that and if there is an area that you see that maybe there are names already filled in but you're like man I really really have a desire to work there just let us know we're happy to accommodate everybody and make sure everybody gets to help And we want to remind you that Brother Bill is doing a very special hymn Sunday, next Sunday. So we're very excited for that. Make sure you come, invite your friends, uh, make sure you tell them to, if they can't come in person, watch on YouTube. We're going to have a beautiful worshipful service with all kinds of hymns. And then the next Sunday will be her Sunday. No, I'm just kidding. I just want to remind you guys 
that we do have a wonderful evangelism article that Brother Dale is doing on the website. The article, the most recent article was titled, How Then Shall We Go? And it was very interesting. It was a really good article. So if you haven't read that one, jump on the website. I encourage you to go look at that. And we have lots of other information on the website as well. And we are so happy to turn this back over to Brother Bill because he has a lot of energy today. So he is ready to go and bring you a beautiful service. So I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Sister Becky. All right. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let us continue. The song says, He has satisfied the thirst and filled the hunger with good things. Let the Spirit of the Lord continue to be in this place today. If you're able to stand, let us stand and sing this beautiful song. This morning, our scripture reading comes from the book of Judges, the 14th chapter, and verse 19. Would you read with me, please? Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. You may be seated. Almighty God, 
You are the Creator. You are the one that makes this wonderful world. You are the sustainer that keeps it going. Without you, it would just cease to exist. And Lord, you are also our Savior. The one who reached down in our fallen, broken state and brought us out of that and forgave us and brings us back into relationship with you. And you are in the process of sanctifying us, making us more holy, making us more like you, that we will eventually be perfect, just as you are perfect. Right now, our righteousness is only your righteousness given to us. Thank you so much. In your gracious name, amen. As we go into the stewardship part of our service today, our thought comes out of Romans 12 in the first verse, and it tells us, it says, therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. You know, this, it says, is your spiritual act of worship. We have to understand that God's first goal in giving is that we give of ourselves. And when we do that, when we reconcile ourselves to God, we grow in His, His mercy and His grace. And we understand the importance of stewardship, the importance of giving. 
And so as we grow, we learn that percentages really don't matter. It's our love of the Lord and what we give. Amen. And we have to think about how wonderful God has been to us and what He has done to us in our lives. And there's just no way to repay it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time we have to worship You with our gifts and our offerings and our tithes. And it's through this that we learn to depend on You. And it's through that learning and leaning that we come to love you even more. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today, we are in the second part of the series in Samson. And we're going to find out that he's going to have a little trouble. Now, last week, we learned that Samson was one of those what we call miracle babies who who was born to, to someone, to a woman who couldn't conceive except by God's power. And we learned that, um, that during that time, an angel of the Lord arrived at Samson's parents' house. And Manoah and his wife learned that she was going to conceive a son. Now, not only did they learn that, but they learned that or they, they were given instructions about how to raise that child and how Manoah's wife was, uh, her dietary plan had changed because Samson was going to be a Nazarite. Now, being a Nazarite meant other things that uh, uh, besides being set aside for God, he was never to cut his hair. He was never to drink wine or strong drink. And he was never supposed to touch anything unclean. And by chapter 14, at the, at, you know, towards the end of, of last week, Samson is at least old enough to consider marriage. But... We learned instead of choosing a spouse from the women of Dan, his tribe, or from another Israelite tribe, he fell in love with a Philistine. Now, Samson didn't know it, but when he did that, he was looking for trouble. And not only did he look for it, he found it, and it was in that little city of Timnah. Now, how he reacted to this first encounter is what led to a lifetime of problems and heartaches for poor Samson. So, if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn to Judges 14. We're going to be looking at that chapter today. And in the first two verses, it says, Samson went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. When he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now get her for me as my wife. You know, good grief. You know, I, I, you, know you read that and you wonder. But first off, what was Samson doing in Timnah in the first place? You know, that, that was a Philistine city. There wasn't any reason for him to go. But it could be that it was, you know, he was down there on a political mission. In other words, like paying taxes because the Philistines had, had uh, taken over the land. Or maybe he had to go and be counted for a census. You know, regardless. While he was there, he just, you know, was uh, enamored to a woman that he saw. You know, where he saw her, who knows. But he became attracted to a Philistine woman. Now, you have to understand that this is wrong on so many levels for, for, for a Jew at that time. First, intermarriage with pagans 
was strictly forbidden in the law of Moses. Right there, he should have known better. Now, second, there's no indication that she was even attracted to him. Remember, the Bible just says he saw her. You know, good grief. Well, in so many words, Samson, when he got back, he told his parents, I saw her, I want her, now you go get her for me. You know, no, no if, ands, and buts. You know, he, he was a very dogmatic individual. Third, and finally, Samson was dragging his parents into this uh, situation when they knew it wasn't good. You know, look at the response of his parents in the next two verses, Judges 14, 3 to 4. His father and mother replied, Isn't there an acceptable woman among the, your relatives or among our people? Must you go to the uncircumcised Philistines to get a wife? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me. She's the right one for me. His parents did not know that this was from the Lord who was seeking an occasion to confront the Philistines. For at that time, they were ruling all over Israel. So we, we, we see uh, what's happening, how Samson is involving his parents and also, you know, the involvement of God. Now, his parents had a, a stronger and a better faith than Samson. But they also understood what would happen in a mixed marriage relationship between an Israelite and a Palestine. You must understand that the Palestinians here, these Palestine people were not a godly people. They worshiped Dagon, a god that was half man and half fish. Now, the Philistines had little, if anything, to do with Israel's God. You know why? Because they had conquered, conquered the Israelites and believed that Dagon was stronger than the God of Israel. So, you know, they were all puffed up. So how could any good come from a relationship with someone who worshipped Dagon? You know, whether in marriage or any other kind of uh, relationship. Yet, what we have to understand, something good was going to happen, even though neither of the parties involved knew it at the time. God, you have to understand, would never approve of an Israelite marrying a pagan. But in this case... Knowing how basically stubborn Samson was, God allowed him to follow his own course. Samson was going to accomplish God's will even though he didn't know it. You know, God was going to use him regardless. Because remember, God told Samson's parents that their son would take the lead in delivering Israel from the Philistines. You know, could this be the beginning of the beginning? Who knows? But we'll see as we, we follow down through the, through the chapters. Now, in verse 5, we learn that Samson's parents probably relented. You know, they gave in to him. Uh, you know, they... They said, all right, if you want to do this, go ahead and we'll, we'll stand beside you. So they traveled with him to Timnah, Judges, uh, uh, the first part of verse 5. Samson went down to Timnah together with his father and mother. As they approached the vineyards of Timnah, now notice here that the writer mentions the vineyards. Did, did it, why didn't he say as they approached Timnah? Well, I'm thinking probably it's to get our minds back to the first um, 
uh, uh, chapter here, the first uh, uh, in chapter 13, where the angel said to his mother, don't eat anything of the vineyards. And also the instructions of Samson not to drink anything, uh, any wine or strong drink, which comes from the vineyards. So it's sort of a, a, um, uh, an idea here just that people will know something's going to happen because something is not right. And as they pass the vineyard, Samson faces the first test of his strength. It says, uh, starting in the end of verse 5, suddenly a young lion came roaring toward him. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as he might have torn a young goat. But he told neither his father nor his mother what he had done. Now, whether the lion actually attacked Samson or whether Samson went chasing the lion. It's, you know, it doesn't say there. But one thing is certain. The Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon Samson. You know, so powerfully that he tore that lion apart. Now, think about that. Have you ever grabbed a stake and tried to rip that thing apart? You can't do it. It isn't easy. No matter how much strength you might have, it just isn't easy. And that Samson was able to survive this attack is proof of God's love and protection for him. We have to understand that, you know, regardless of Samson's uh, faults. And since the next sentence reads, but he told neither his mother or father what he had done, it's apparent he was alone when that happened. Now, you know, in the first part of that, it said they were traveling down to Timnah, you know, all three of them. For some reason, they were separated. It could be that his parents went on ahead, or it could be that Samson left them there by the vineyards and went ahead to scout for uh, bandits. Because remember, they, you know, there, there were thieves and bandits along the roads. Uh, what, whatever the situation, he was alone when this happened. But why didn't he tell his parents what he had done? You know, how, you know, how, how great about killing a lion. You know, I would have been bragging. You know, it could be that Samson was afraid that they might interpret that as a sign of God's disapproval. You know, that God didn't want the marriage to happen. And Samson is under the mindset, regardless of what God wants, I want the marriage. Or maybe he didn't want them to know that he had broken a portion of his Nazarite vow. You see, Samson was determined to marry this Philistine woman. And in seven, he went down and talked with the woman, and he liked her. Now, think about that verse. He had told his parents that she pleased him. You know, this reads like he had never talked to her before this time. You know, it's, uh, it's amazing. He just saw her in the distance, sort of, and said, all right, I want her. She's going to be mine. He selected it. He thinks it's, it's a done deal. Now, between verses 7 and 8 is a period of time that takes place. And we don't know how much time. It just says sometime later. And it's probably during this time frame that Samson gets to know her better and proposes, maybe meets her parents, etc. And incredibly, she accepts. And then in verses 8 and 9, we see another of Samson's sins or a violation of his Nazarite vow. It says, when he went back to marry her, he turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. And in it, he saw a swarm of bees and some honey. 
He scooped out the honey with his hands and ate as he went along. When he rejoined his parents, here, for some reason, they've separated again. Maybe he wanted to take the high road and they took the low road. Yeah, who knows? But when he rejoined them, it continues, he gave them some and they ate too. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. Because remember, Nazarites aren't supposed to go anything, anywhere near a dead thing. And a lion's carcass would certainly meet that criteria. The lion's body had laid there long enough to decay to the point where the bees had been able to build a hive in it and build a, a, a honeycomb. So that's what Samson did. He saw that and he just reached his hand in there and scooped it out. Now, personally, I wouldn't reach my hand in a hive of bees, but, you know, that's something else. He was hungry. He ate it and gave some to his parents, but he didn't tell them where he found it. This makes the second time that Samson hasn't shared with his parents something that really he should have. Now, as we get down to verses 10 through 14, we get into the wedding. You know, Samson and his parents on the way down to the wedding or to have the wedding. It says, um, uh, you know, this, this really should have been a happy time for Samson. You know, really a wedding is supposed to be a happy time regardless. Judges 14.10. Now his father went down to see the woman. There Samson held a feast as was customary for young men. Now, it, you don't see Samson's mother mentioned here, yet she traveled with him. I'm under the assumption that this is like a, a man's um, event. In other words, it's sort of like a bachelor party. It's, it's a feast, but only the men could attend. You have to understand during biblical times, women weren't very high on the totem pole. You know, they, they were second class, third, fourth class citizens. But still what we see here is that only his father attended that feast. And it tells us that, uh, you know, in verse 10, that this was a feast that was uh, customary. In other words, we're seeing a little bit of the Philistine uh, wedding uh, plan. So they, they have a feast. And in keeping with tradition, Samson says, okay, you know, I'll hold a feast, but I'm going to do one thing better. I'm going to put forth a riddle and make a wager with you all. And Samson told the Philistines that if they couldn't guess the answer, they would have to provide him 30 sets of clothes. Now, you, you, you have to, to realize here that there were 30 special individuals at that wedding reception or, or that wedding feast. So that's what these clothes are for. And he said, if you manage to guess the answer... I will give you a new set. You know, he said, if, if you don't, you give to me 30. So he'll get 30 changes of clothes. And if they don't guess it, he'll give to them one change of clothes each, or 30. You know, it's, it's still 30 changes of clothes. And in verse 11, it goes... When the people saw him, they chose 30 men to be his companions. That's that special 30. Let me tell you a riddle, said, Samson said to them. If you can give me the answer within the seven days of the feast, you know, these things go on for a week, I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. If you can't tell me the answer, you must give me 30 linen garments and 30 sets of clothes. You know, he, Samson was under the assumption that he could just outwit these stupid Palestinians. Otherwise, I doubt if he would have made such a wager. You know, he was 
just full of himself. And so, you know, the 30 men said, tell us your riddle. Let's hear it. He replied, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Now, think about us if we had heard that riddle. We didn't know Samson had gone and killed a lion. He hadn't told anybody. You know, the Philistines had no idea what he was talking about. You know, they must not have been a very riddle-solving people. And it says in uh, the end of 14, and for three days they could not give the answer. You know, he said, come back every night, you know, and, you know when the party starts and give me an answer. Now, like Samson, they didn't want to lose either, especially to someone whose land they had conquered and ruled over. So the first thing that Samson's friends, so to speak, did was put pressure on the bride. You know, she's a Philistine to help them get the answer. Judges 14, 15. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, coax your husband into explaining the riddle for us. Or we will burn you and your father's household to death. Did you invite us here to steal our property? Now, think of that. They they are accusing her of wanting to steal their property as though she wanted their clothes. You know, good grief. Then she begins to show her true self. Instead of being loyal to her new husband, what did she do? She starts crying and starts throwing a tantrum. She needed that answer, and she wanted it right then. So, you know, comes the tears and the tantrum. Judges 6, uh, verse 16. Then Samson's wife threw herself on him, sobbing. You hate me. You don't really love me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. Now, Samson, I hate to say it, acts like a typical male. He simply just brushed it off by saying in verse 17, I haven't even explained it to my mother and father, he replied. So why should I explain it to you? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a male logic. I can see it. Then the bride became desperate. And you know what she did? She started crying. And she continued crying. And she cried the whole seven days of the feast. You know, she, it says in uh, the first part of verse 17, she cried the whole seven days. Now, how she could keep those tears going for seven days, it, it's, it, you know, the Bible doesn't really reveal that. You know, it's, it's almost too much to believe, but she did. And eventually, Samson, you know, like a typical male, had had enough. And he just threw in the tile, so to speak, and told her the answer. He says on the end of, uh, end of 17, so on the seventh day, he finally told her because she continued to press him. She, in turn, explained the riddle to her people. You know, what did she do? Did she thank him for the answer? No. Did she express her love for him? I don't see it. Did she ever reveal the threats that the Philistines had, had, had you know, confronted her with? No record of it anywhere. The one thing that she did was promptly tell those 30 guests the answer to the riddle. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that's just not an example of genuine love for your spouse. And to add insult to injury, the Philistines came to him, it says, before sunset on the seventh day. 
they waited right to the last minute. And when Samson was getting all puffed up, thinking that he had won, it says in 18, Before sunset on the seventh day, the men of the town said to him, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? You know, no wonder Samson said to him, you know, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Now think about calling your wife a heifer. Is that a very nice thing? Hmm. But he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy with what had happened. He had been tricked. He had been betrayed. And that just had to hurt. Judges 14, 9, the first part of 9. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 of their men, we're talking about Philistines, stripped them of everything and gave their clothing to those who had explained the riddle. This was the second time that the power or the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. You know, he, he was just frustrated. And he went down to Ascalon. He's thinking, you know, I have to give these men 30 changes of clothes. So, he said, I'll show them. And he goes down kills 30 Philistines and takes their clothes. Now, you know, who knows? Were they of the upper class, middle class, or lower class? You know, it just said he had to give them 30 changes of clothes. And then once he did that, he just picked up his toys and went home. He went back angry and hurt. It says, burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. But what about Samson's bride? You know, didn't, wasn't he going to take her with him? You know. The bride's father, thinking, you know, probably thinking that Samson was never coming back because of what he had done, he gave her to the best man. Now, wasn't that nice? You know, Judges 14.20. And Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had tended him at the feast. Here we are at the end of Samson's trouble in Timnah. Yeah, think about it. The guests got the clothes in payment for the wager. The girl got the husband, you know, not the one that she originally married. The bride's father... He saved face by getting rid of a jilted bride. And Samson left Timnah with nothing but heartache. You know, these, you know, we, we wonder what, what can we learn from anything? You know, because the Bible is, is filled with lessons. Well, we have to understand and learn that to believe in God and be called by God is only as good as the person who actually lives it out. You know, for, for Christians today, we have to remember to take action. James 2.6, 2.26 says, As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. And as Christians, we know that we are what we are called to do and that we must strive to do it. Another lesson is that all people, including Christians saved by grace, are prone to sin. Just because you've been saved doesn't mean that you're never going to sin again. We are all prone to sin. And Samson, even though he sinned much, his faith grew. And in the end, he died for the glory of God. And we'll see that in further chapters. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you
for this time that we have to, to study about Samson, to see how we can apply uh, the error of his ways and, and understand your will. We, we ask that you help us see God's will in all that we do. There are things that are happening, especially in the situation our country has found us in this past year and a half, that we don't understand. But what we do understand, Lord, is that you are in control. And we thank you, Lord, that you do love us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, before...